How you doing? Good to see you, bud. Good. Good. Ah, nice to see you on uh, on Meyer's side chat. So a long time ago, I was on Brock on the Block. You were Brock and your Block, and you were on that because you were doing a wonderful mural right at Maine, just uh, north of Ocean Park Boulevard. And you ca we came down to film you because you were doing something extraordinary in the city, saying art on the walls of the city. Let's not have drab walls. Let's have walls with messages. Let's have walls that speak to people, that make people smile, that make them happy and make them think. That's right. That's right. You actually nailed it. The whole intention of Beautify was actually... Or is actually to end ugly wall syndrome, as we call it. There you go. Or boring wall syndrome or bland wall syndrome. There's and there are no vaccinations for that. No. Only good art. Only good art. You cannot vaccinate. I guess good art is the vaccination. There you go. In a manner of speaking. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I found, and one of the reasons I sort of chose art as a path uh, here was that I thought it would be generally non confrontational right most people agree this is santa monica <laughs> our sport is confrontation and discussion that's not santa monica that's the world yeah well that's unfortunate it, it's we unfortunate. all know that, that um, that's a sad thing but we can change santa monica right we can do what we can here in santa monica and i guess my way of doing it at the um and i guess what i expressed on the interview is this this, this wall can can change how people think um, and I think art can do that. And it's 99% non-confrontational. It really is something that most people go, wow, beautiful. Love the way it looks. Love it makes you think not everyone loves every piece all the time. Um, but it's sort, of, it's sort of a microcosm of what politics can be, I find. Right? Most people go, oh, I don't really love it, but it's beautiful. Right? If you don't like it, and if you do like it, you say, wow, this is great. Um, so great. What a beautiful addition to the city. Um, but everyone realizes it's better than an ugly wall or a boring wall or a blank wall. Most people, yeah. 99%. And, and, and look at, you know, uh, the reason I interviewed you years ago is because I wanted to make sure that residents in the city started thinking about more art in our city, more sculptures, more artistic endeavors. And then to take that and also say, how do we expose the culture? in the city? How do we expose the people who came before us in the city? How do we find ways when people go to the beach that they leave Santa Monica with more than a few grains of sand? They yeah. leave with something else here in their mind that says, wow, Santa Monica is a special place. Santa Monica is a cradle of art, a cradle of culture, and a cradle of innovation. How do we make Santa Monica not just be Oh, yeah, we're going to the pier today, but let's make it more than the pier. Yeah. And, and let's really celebrate the people here, the art, the music, the, the writing, all the different facets. It's been said that, before, now this is pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, 41% of our working residents worked in the arts. That's extraordinary. That may be one of the highest in the world in a city. So... But then we walk around the streets of Santa Monica. You mentioned a few minutes ago before we started that there's a sculpture by the <laughs> Victorian. It faces a tree in the inside of the lot. Yeah. Yeah. We have a sculpture that no one even knows about. Yeah. So Unless you sat in the farmer's market. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right. so, and, and that should change. And, and one of the things I hope you'll partner with me on is making sure that we change that that has a city, we join together to make sure our city becomes a cradle of the arts in LA. Yeah. That from theater to dance, you know, we don't have really one sprung dance floor in the city. We, we, there is, there's, there's, there's a, um, we'll call it a, uh, <laughs> there's one by the, the, by the beach on the boardwalk by Perry's. That's every time I go out there, there's always dance lessons. It's not really a dance floor, but they're right. using the area. Right. But, and it's beautiful because I'm like, wow, there's open people, dance lessons, learning right. right by the... It's like exactly what should be happening there. Right. It's beautiful. And, and we need more of that because that also, you know, in, in society now, nationally, statewide, and then you keep coming down to the microcosm of Santa Monica, 
you don't always see, you see rancor. And one way to dispel that is through the use of the arts, through, through your murals, through art, through sculpture, through dance and music and writing and all the things that make people come together. And, and I think what we'd like to do is people to walk around our city, feel safe, A, and then B, feel that there's always something extraordinary happening in the city. And a lot of that is for the public to enjoy. So uh, a few years ago, I wrote a smart column about Olympic Boulevard and said from uh, Bergamot Station to 11th Street, that middle divider should be a constant changing path of sculptures of art because nobody walks on Olympic Boulevard. I mean, nobody walks Olympic. So change that. Uh, put a senior walking path down that middle. Have art up and down there. Pads that, like they do in West Hollywood. Yep. Um, that art can be shown. Those are things we need to do in the yeah. city. Well, and, and mainly I think one of the things that, you know, I started wrapping my mind around when I started this endeavor was that art, for this art's sake, is just art. But art has the capacity to bring people together, to get people to think, to get people of all walks of life to stand together and talk and communicate. It has the capacity to increase foot traffic and business revenue, uh, pedestrian activity. It has the capacity to keep streets cleaner, uh, the reverse broken windows theory. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much that art can do. It's, al it's almost something that I believe should become an economic conversation. It's, it's, part, it's, it's almost part of the economic development um, uh, activities of the city would be, would be worthwhile thinking of, of, of how the arts can So can what you're talking about really is in the Middle Ages, you know, there were the Crusades. And they, they pillaged and they burned and they decided they were going to conquer. Well, we don't want to do that in Santa no. Monica. But, we but could, all those sites are now famous. But we <laughs> could do a crusade yeah. of bringing art and culture and the businesses that are here and getting them to expose what they do. Um, you know, and making it public and making sure that residents in our neighborhoods who, I, I did a Brock in your block, one of the last ones I did before I was elected, was just a walk through our neighborhoods in the city. And it was extraordinary that if you look at that episode, there are sculptures, and fountains on private property all through the city. Yeah. And while it really made me happy, and especially when we were all locked down, but it made me sad that we weren't doing any of that publicly. That our residents actually had more art yeah. displayed, more sculptures, more uh, varied, unique things yeah. than we did as a city. Yeah. And that, that, uh, made me feel that we really do need a modern crusade in okay. Santa Monica of <laughs> sure. culture. Sure. And, and here's a quick story. Uh, uh, a writer who lives up in the north part of the city a few years ago called me and said, you know, I want to, there used to be a, a, a wonderful uh, writing room where uh, new scripts were shown and, and at the Cornet Theater in Los Angeles for years. And it was every Monday night and people would crowd in to see Ed Asner and Denzel Washington, whoever else was on stage, just doing stage readings of new scripts. And it was this extraordinary thing and it was free. Yeah. And he wanted, you. he said, can we use Miles Playhouse? And I said, that would be a wonderful idea. And the city said, no. The cultural affairs director at the time was like, well, no, we can't do that. And I thought that was so wrong that we needed to, if somebody wanted to do a, a, a stage reading series at Miles Playhouse, they shouldn't have to pay for it. They're residents of the city. And if they did, they just needed to pay the janitor to, to lock the door at the end. And, and those things I thought were things that could enrich people. And if you look at, uh, someone said last night in the city council meeting, they called it uh, the before times. It was interesting. It sounded like a you know Hunger Games movie yeah. or The Purge, but but for me, it meant something else. It said, 
when residents felt there was a, a that they couldn't leave their houses anymore, they couldn't go to the Hollywood Bowl, they couldn't go downtown, it was taking them an hour, hour and a half each way in traffic. Why aren't we creating culture, creating series of different types of programs in Santa Monica at our parks? Yeah. Why aren't we having movies at our parks and picnics and, and uh, creative writing exercises and poetry readings and all of these things in our municipal parks? I always thought Tongva Park should have, I mean, there's, there's a, somewhat of an amphitheater, not quite, but a seating arrangement around mm -hmm. the park. It's supposed there, to be right? an amphitheater, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's wonderful. The park is beautiful. And I always wondered why every Sunday there's not, you know, activity going on there. And I know there's reasons for it, but... Well, part of the original thing was it was supposed to have, uh, dan you know, different types of yeah. activities. It's had some. And, it's had some. But it needed to be a consistent yeah. effort. And uh, as time went on in that park, unfortunately, it, it's been seen as a, a park with a lot of bad activity. Yeah. So residents now have shied away from going to the park right. because there's not enough of those great activities. Yeah. Sounds like an opportunity. <laughs> and, and the other part is it's named Tongva Park. So I want you to walk through the park and tell me where you can find out why it's named Tongva Park and what it has to do with the people who lived here before. So are there any plaques? Is there any displays, any interactive displays? Is there anything that talks about the people who inhabited this land first? Because that was the reason for the park. Yeah, right. Um, you're down the street from Hotchkiss Park, right where we are right now. Tell me about Hotchkiss. Uh, well, I go there Probably who once is, a day. Is it a her? Is it a he? Oh, who is this Hotchkiss person? Um, oh, you mean not my activity at Hotchkiss, but no. more about the background of, of Hotchkiss. Why is it named Hotchkiss? Yeah. There, is, there is something in that. There's a sculpture there, which is a strange sculpture. Um, yeah. Yeah, but there is. I, I think, don't think it has a relation to, 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 to that person. To the individual Hotchkiss. I'm not so, sure. So we, could do we could do better at, at that so type of every part, education. Yeah. So why is Douglas Park named Douglas, which is probably the park that your child will like the most in the Kirk city. Douglas. No. <laughs> See? <laughs> why is so it how long, how long have you lived here now? Uh, 10, 15, a decade. 16, 17. A decade and a half. Yeah, something like that. Wow. Yeah. You're almost, an honorary, you're almost an honorary native now. 2005 or six. yeah. So here's, here's part of that crusade. Part of that crusade for art and culture in the city is also to identify our history and expose our history. And those things are important. So Douglas Park was the first site of Douglas Aircraft. That was his factory and his original landing strip. And it then became Douglas Park. So there is a small plaque inside the little building by lawn bowling there. Yep. But there needs to be something out in the open that says this was an airfield. This was the, the you know one of the aircraft pioneers. This is where he started. Sure. And, and, do and you think, Hotchkiss, yeah, uh, Mary Hotchkiss. Yeah. Uh, there was a mansion there, and if I recall, I may be wrong on this, but I think there was a very strange murder that happened there, and a lot of other stuff. Uh, we'll have we'll have our fact checkers investigate that murder story. There you go. Can you guys investigate that murder story? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to me, uh, back to Tonga Park. Yeah. The same thing. The Tonga Indians were important to this area. And and the top of Samohai, where they just uh, cut off the history building, mm -hmm. that was the top of Indian Hill because the Indians could look out at the ocean and see when the boats were coming, the canoes and everything back from fishing, from hunting, going to Catalina, whatever they were doing, right? That's, that was the lookout. Yeah. So I think as a, as a city, we should know those things. Uh, as a city, I do believe it's important to have that sort of cultural, well, for one, it builds, it builds the, uh, the cultural assets of a city. 
-hmm. It creates cultural assets that may have just been overlooked. Um, and you could do that everywhere. Buildings have history. I mean, we could put plaques on buildings. I saw that in Park City. It was beautiful. They showed like the history of the building and these little plaques. I thought that was that's always um, interesting. We did the one. I remember uh, the horse, the horse latch. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's down here somewhere. I think it's on Hollister. Yeah, right by Ocean. There's a little horse latch, and I remember celebrating that, uh, which was really cool. Uh, and it's a tiny little thing, but those are kind of tours we can put on that can really enhance. And I, I would find it hard to imagine that anyone would disagree with that. Like this conversation, what we're talking no, no, about right no. now, you'd have to imagine everyone on council would be like, sure, more culture and activity and history, and right? That's rich, quality stuff. Yeah, and, and looking at, you know, uh, I've heard so many stories growing up about who lived on this block, you know, who lived on this block. Jimmy Doolittle lived up in that area and there was, you know, a major, con one of the members of a, a major comedy movie act yep. lived on Ocean Avenue and all these different people lived here. I mean, I'd love to see, you know, in LA they have, after the 84 Olympics, they started the banner program. And it'd be great as you go down Ocean Avenue just to have every once in a while, yeah. those banners hanging, not advertising banners, yeah. but banners, you know, saying this, this person, was a resident here. Yeah. Oh, that's An interesting. Aircraft pioneer, right? Yeah. Amelia Earhart took off on a couple of her voyages here. Lindbergh took off from SMO as well. Yeah. So all these people that you read about in history, many of them There's a relationship had a to connection the here, which is yeah. why also I'm in favor of a museum of the beach. And and I wish we could have rescued the Sears building. Imagine with no uh, windows, well, right? How great that would have been as a, a museum yeah. of beach culture. I think that would have been fantastic. Now it's, uh, at the moment, it's handling COVID. Um, the parking lot, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so this is a great yes. example of things that, you know, and the purpose of this conversation and why Meyer side chats exists is to talk about these things that bring us together um, and also talk about the things that um, can continue to bring us together where perhaps people are diverging uh, and whether it's natural or social media augmented in some way where it's you know propelled and narratives get propelled I, I don't know it, it, my, my feeling is that the stories here and the politics on both sides seem to be uh, to emulate same sort of narrative problems that we have at the federal level um, and where you can sort of get into an echo chamber and it's hard to find common ground if you stay in an echo chamber. And how do we, so I'd like to sort of say if we use art as a base and we put that as the, the foundation of what's, of what's possible, assuming everyone agrees on that, because there's lots of things we all agree on. Um, that's just one of them. Um, but how do we start to dispel this distrust that people have in government? How do we start to dispel this, uh, this concept of echo chambers where information is just one-sided? Because there is polarity here. And there is two sides to every story. Um, and there is a conversation that can happen whether people disagree. We can disagree in harmony, at least. We can disagree in a way that people understand. How do we move in this direction? Why is there distrust and how do we start to get rid of it? Well, I think for one thing, the leaders in your city have to be willing to listen to all sides of every issue. And they really have to get down and talk to residents in all neighborhoods. I, I think that's important. Uh, there was a perception, whether wrong or right, doesn't, doesn't matter because there's not really two sides to an issue. There's probably three, four, five sides sure. to every issue. Sure. But there was a, a perception in the city for the last decade or so that the leaders of the city had stopped listening to the people in apartments on the streets uh, of the city, stopped listening to the business community, stopped listening to the residential communities. I think that has to be reinvigorated, and I think it is. I think people are starting to to realize that they're not locked out of the city. They have to feel that they have a voice. Otherwise, there's no reason for city government. And, and I think that's important. Uh, you want a city government that uses common sense. 
And then you take that common sense and you start to be willing to hear from all sides. Your, your leaders should be doing town halls. Your leaders should be talking to anybody who wants to talk to them. And I know it's difficult. Now, I've only been in office a year. Uh, but I spent almost 18 years as a commissioner in the city, as recreation and parks, arts commissioner, and I've been involved, as you know, with a ton of nonprofits in the city. So I was very used to listening and talking, hearing people who agreed with me, hearing people who disagreed. What was interesting, and, and we shared this a little bit, I won't go into it, but we shared this a little bit before we started this afternoon, that people get put into camps. Right. People in Santa Monica, because development is such a big issue, because people, residents love this city. They really love the fact that there's fresh air and the outdoors. They love the fact that the beach is there, even if they don't go to it, but it's there. They love the fact that we have a separate identity from Los Angeles and especially long-term residents. So I'll speak for myself. I, I, when I was growing up, my grandfather, we'd drive down San Vicente, and the minute you went past 26th Street, the grass wasn't mowed on the east side. You hit LA. You knew there was a difference, right? If you went down Olympic, mm -hmm. all of a sudden past the Pobeda, there are the big buildings. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have that in Santa Monica. So there was a really good feeling that we were special, that we were different. And I think part of that is as you have a, and I'll go back to art and culture in a second, but I was thinking, you, I was thinking you would. <laughs> has, has, there you go. As you, as you look at the city for new residents, you need them to buy in to the reason they moved here, that we're not LA, yeah. that we're not Chicago, we're not New York, that we don't want to just be an appendage that we want to be a place where citizens, residents are empowered. That's a big thing, is making sure that residents are empowered to help control their street's destiny, their neighborhood's destiny, and their city's destiny. And I think that's, for lack of a, a better, I don't even know if I have a term for it, but there was a general malaise set in because people in Santa Monica, many people felt that they no longer had that voice. Now. It may be they weren't seeking it, right? But it felt harder and harder for them to have an impact. Yeah. So I think one thing is for the camps to break up. Sorry, camps. But to make sure that people really talk to each other. And, and you said something a minute ago. There's not one side or two sides to an issue. There are many sides that people need to come together whenever they can. And on the things they disagree with, start talking to each other and coming up with a solution. Right. Rather than, well, you know, Phil Brock is anti-development. Phil Brock's not anti-development. You know, Phil Brock wants to see a city that is livable and is a beachside, comfortable, special place and I'll I'll use that special again but to me that's really important to me we're a place that we should be able to control to some extent the safety of our streets knowing we're not an island mm -hmm. but uh, we can help control the safety of our streets we can help uh, do more to solve our version of homelessness in Santa Monica to be more effective at that and, and for residents, make sure that they feel that they're involved in every conversation that happens, that they're not left out. And, and I think that's an important thing, is that I want people to feel that they're part of the conversation. And part of it, even as strange as it seems, is you're involved in the OPA parade, right? Ocean Park Parade. Sure. Well, you, you, as you go down the street on, um, you know, on your special uh, transportation during that day on the Segway or whatever, roller, whatever oh comes yeah. next now, besides since Segways or rollerblades or rollerblades or whatever it is, <laughs> right? What you, what 
makes you do that is the fact that you see people smiling that day. That yeah, you see people it. coming together as a community. So I think that's how do we bring people together? How do we get rid of the polarization? Yeah. Is to remind everyone that we're a community. And, and we want to see there's so many good things that happen here. How do we make those become paramount? Well, and I think, you know, we're hitting on the real issue. Polarization is having these camps of people that are in echo chambers. And um, I want to say often are unwilling to listen to things they disagree with. Right? Like, I think it's important, whatever news you watch, local or federal, whatever, you have to listen. At least half of the news you need to listen to is things you disagree with. It may, you may not like it, but you have to be willing to hear it, right. accept what they're saying, and try to understand why they're coming from where they're coming from. So people don't watch Fox News. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. So that would be, <laughs> see, I, and I or, would, or watch a piece of Fox News, but also watch news on all sides. I would just say, yeah, see, I would say you have to watch, if you, if, if you don't, if you want to hear what people are saying and reading and listening to, you have to hear and listen and read the thing that they're, that's where they're getting their information from. So you can't have, you can't even have an, uh, uh, a debate. You can't come to uh, uh, a solution if you're not hearing where people are coming from. So... And I, I, I do stand by that. I think it's important. I think here we have to be able to do, people should be sitting down with people they disagree with, have a coffee and not yell at them and say, let's have coffee. Let's talk about how our kids go to the same college or how we both love to watch, you know, uh, Westerns. Find, or, finding common ground. Find the common ground. And this is possible. Yeah. But... Sometimes, you know, and, and I, be, I, I truly believe it's possible and I truly believe we can do it in Santa Monica, but we have to be able to set some standards as to what should be the, 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 the conduct when we're giving our two minute um, uh, of public speaking. Right? So like are, you, are you saying there has to be one standard of civility for all? No, I'm saying <laughs> if you want there to be civility, there needs to be a code of civility that you, you can express yourself how you'd like. But what we are requesting here, in a sense, if in order to see common ground, is um, to take in as much good quality information as we can, to listen and learn and understand it, put that in what I call like a matrix, and we're going to digest that. But they, people have to be willing to communicate that in at least a somewhat calm fashion or else you end up in the emotional aspect of the conversation. And it's hard to um, assess things fairly or in an impartial way without feeling like you're attacked, right? You may get someone comes up there and says, Phil, how could you do all these things? Like, that's crazy and you're an idiot or whatever, right? People call names. Name calling. Who calls names as an adult? There are people who do these days. There are. I, I, but, you know, I, and I think part of, But we're so, adults. We should really... So you and I were at the <laughs> same event two Saturdays ago. I, I met your child there. That's right. And... He remembers you. And <laughs> that was good. I like that comeback. But, but... Well, it's two but, months. Two months. I, yeah. <laughs> it, I, indelible image forever. But... but um, you know what I what we faced were yelling, screaming, spitting people who were very angry and wanted to make their point about vaccines. Right. And um, I listened to the yelling and screaming. I tried to talk to one person. Yep. Right. And I, in fact, I offered. I think you had just talked to one of them, and I went and talked to one of the other protesters and said, if you will give the speakers 10 minutes to speak, I'm happy to sit down and listen to you and, and hear what you mm -hmm. have to say. Sure. Well, that didn't work right then, but it worked 45 minutes later. Eventually it worked, as, yeah. you, as, you, as you may have been leaving, I was in a conversation with Bullhorn Lady. Yeah. I, uh -huh. I'll call her that because I don't know. Yeah. I'm supposed to remember her name. Sorry. But she stopped yelling. I, yeah, I remember that. And she even had a laugh. I remember leaving as she, as she was laughing, and I thought that was a good, uh, 
Um, yeah, a good way to dissolve. We kept talking. Yeah. I, I think, as you just said a minute ago, people stop talking to each other. Yeah. And you have to sometimes wait for that anger to dissipate. Right. Because no, it's really hard to stay angry for a long time. You know, it really is. You, you run out of energy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what you do is you, you listen to the yeah. vitriol, you, you know, and you have to learn to try not to uh, react yeah. in a negative way because your first instinct would either be yell back or walk away, I'm done. Right. Right. And I stood there along with the city manager. And I think I was there till 3.30, talking and mm -hmm. listening. Now, she didn't necessarily change my mind. Yeah. I, I'm a strong believer that people should be vaccinated. I was a strong believer uh, four months ago that we should have joined the same mandate as LA and Culver City and West Hollywood, that to eat inside, you need to show your vaccine yeah. card because that would spur more people to be vaccinated. Sure. And I believed... I believe in science. I believe the vaccinations work. So for me, she wasn't gonna change my mind, but it gave her great comfort that not only did I listen, but I invited her to send me information Yep. and that we could keep the dialogue going. That's what we have to do more of in the city, Yeah. is find ways to keep that dialogue going. Find ways when someone's very upset because their catalytic converter got stolen yesterday or uh, they got assaulted walking down the street to try and work on solutions, to try and make sure that we're hearing, that we're not just ignoring, that we're not just, uh, you know, shoving under the rug, that we're saying, yeah, we have to do better. And then working together to find solutions yeah. To work better because it comes down to the common good how do you make sure that i want this to be a safe city for your wife safe city for your child i don't really care if it's a safe city for you but no no but you know what i mean thanks uh, yeah, no problem anytime danger for me yeah safety for everyone there else that'd but, be a hard thing to create but i suppose but but the the, the point of that is we want the community to feel safe. We want the community to feel heard. Yep. And that's not just a, a, a we as in me, that should be a we as in all of us listening and talking to each other yep. and working to solve our problems together. Uh, that's from development to uh, you know, global warming to uh, safety on our streets to everything in our city. How do we work together in our community to make sure our community is a better community, is becomes a little bit more tranquil and becomes a community that everyone wants to be in? And we know people want to be here. Yeah, that's, a, that's obvious. That's, that's, the real estate values indicate that. Yeah, I mean, you're here, right? And you've, <laughs> For a long, and, you've, and you've stayed. For many years, yeah. So you love the community. Well, I've decided, you know, Although I got- you're moving next week. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, no, I'm, I have I have no plans for that at, at this moment. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, I loved it enough where I decided to dedicate a lot of my life and time and 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 heart to it to improving it in the way that I thought I could. Why? Because you know, I've already changed the it, thing here. I'm now interviewing. Now you're interviewing. Sure, I'm. Ha <laughs> <laughs> I do that very easily. It's good. It's good. It encourages conversation. Um, the, you know, I think the, what got me going was I remember a conversation with my buddy, uh, business partner and one of my closest friends, um, uh, Jeff Chernick, who said to me, you know, I, I, or I, I, we were driving and I complained about like a utility box or a traffic light or something. And he's like, and, and we were, you know, this was 15 geez, years ago or something. He, and he heard me complain. He's like, you know, you're complaining about it. Why don't you go do something about it? Isn't that a perfect analogy for what we all want yeah. in Santa Monica? Yeah. Uh, what have I been saying for the yeah. last 20 minutes? I want people to feel empowered to help. But guess what? I did. 
And, and that's unusual. And now there's over 130 murals in Santa Monica. You know, and that's very <laughs> that's unusual. You know that. Most I, people would not keep going. So you had a special drive, or as they would have said in my typing class in eighth grade, a special zeal uh, yeah. to work harder. And, 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 and push against the grain where everyone was saying, I mean, it was funny. I remember even in, it was hard to get support for it in the beginning. It felt like a rogue activity. It was, it was legal. But mm -hmm. no one, it was before street art had this big, you know, what, what's now super popular, right? Everyone's looking at street art as an opportunity for urban improvement and, um, and positive messaging. And, but that, that's really why I thought it was, you know, I, I'm, I'm sick of it. I got sick of talking and not enough doing. And, and that's a good thing. That's yeah. something we want our residents to do. So it's interesting, you know, the, people will say, well, my God. You know, the rest, how do you listen to all of them? And I turn around and say, I want, the, I want to listen to them more. And I want them <laughs> to talk more, but I also want action. Yeah. So, as you know, like I'm a trustee of ELKS. ELKS mm -hmm. um, helps veterans and helps children. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, I'm former president and lieutenant governor of Kiwanis. Kiwanis helps children worldwide. Um, has a lieutenant governor sounds like some military thing, but it's not. I was uh, the regional head, if you will, of the clubs from Malibu to Long Beach. So for a year, I traveled to every club and tried to get more people to volunteer and more people to help out. I did a, a wonderful event, and I, I'll pat myself on the back for this. Okay. I can pat. I can give you the pat too. But, <laughs> but this is make a mess day, yeah. and make a mess day. We had five hundred and fifty children and their parents show up at Bergamot. I had 30 galleries at Bergamot open their doors on a Sunday. We had art projects out for the kids. And the most marvelous thing, I saw fathers getting dirty with their children doing art. That was one of the most wonderful things we've done. Yeah. And, and that's something we need to do more of. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm president of Santa Monica High School alumni. We have 50,000 living alums, and I'm president of that. I used to be president of the Boys and Girls Club Council. I'm, I'm vice chair now of the Salvation Army, which has a, a vital role to play in helping relieve the homelessness crisis in Santa Monica and throughout L.A. And preventing many ma a mattress from going on the street. Yeah, differently, but yeah. <laughs> But, but um, you know, but I will say this, your donations that you take to the Levin Street facility, that's what helps their rehab facilities, that's what helps get people off of drugs and alcohol, yeah. and gives them good jobs and changes their lives. It's, it's pretty amazing. So, to me, all those things are a way to get people involved in the city. My, my significant other is president of Lions. She's president, uh, she's events chair of something called the Breakfast Club, which strangely enough, it's not about breakfast, it's about dental care for kids who can't afford it. Yeah. There are all these different ways to get involved in the city, whether it's painting murals, or being a city commissioner, or just helping a nonprofit, or helping clean up your neighborhood, right. or forming a neighborhood watch. But the trick is being active. Right. Yeah. What's the purpose and, of and being open? Being and, and saying, being I'm not just concerned with my own life. I'm also concerned about how I help my fellow humans. Sure. Well, what's the point of watching news at all if it just makes you anxious and angry? Yeah. If you're not going to take action to realize that you could be part of the solution and improve something, which would be meaningful change, then really what you're doing is just giving advertisers money. <laughs> To, 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 to or find ways to be depressed. And, and you know, and, and yeah, right. sorry it's... I'm interrupting you, but you know, here, here's the thing. Everything we all say, politics is local. Life is local. You can't, we can't change the world, but we can change our community. We can change our block. We can give a kid a scholarship. We can, we can help uh, clothe a veteran. Sure. We can you know, uh, get volunteers from Samohai to help paint a mural with you. We can do all these different things that, that may sound small sometimes, 
that may but that is what changes the world that is what changes yeah. the world because it's it's and this comes up every time this kind of concept of uh, thinking globally and acting locally it's you know in in business you'd call that sometimes something like land and expand right where you start in a small market right right sure. you, you wouldn't try to sell your product to the entire planet but if you can build something that's valuable for your for your community uh, then you can build something that's valuable for the community next year's sure. and your county and your state sure. and, and that's how well, it starts but you can't start by going oh everything should be different and I'm gonna hate everything and make everyone's life miserable I talked to you about it a little bit over <laughs> a, a little bit over a century ago rotary started yeah all volunteer business people in their communities Kiwana started all volunteer business people and, and people in their communities. Lions started, and they got their charge by one of their first conventions, and their guest speaker was Helen Keller. And Helen Keller challenged them to be the eyes of the world. Now, that, that wasn't exactly her words, and, but, and my, my significant other will kill me for not having memorized that. But all those things started between like 1915, 1920. Literally, about a hundred years ago, and they took off like wildfire. Wildfire, fire. They went from community to community. There are a million Lions Club members around the world, million, who help in their local communities, uh, providing food and clothing and and uh, vision care and all those different things. Kiwanis, the same thing. Uh, the Alps started uh, after the Civil War, 1869 in New York City, an English actor uh, had moved from England and they started with just a bunch of their friends and first having drinks and hanging out. And then they started saying, there are all these people coming back from the Civil War who are destitute, who were, they've lost limbs, they're injured, and how do we help them? And the Elks then took off and became an organ of volunteers who help in every city, almost every city throughout the United States. And, and for instance, at the VA, they provide for uh, one of the buildings at the VA, they provide the clothing, the, the uh, appliances, the computers, everything for a building at the VA of 50 formerly homeless veterans. They do it. They get no reimbursement. You know, all they do is get the the inner peace of when they go home at night saying they help someone. Yeah, that's, that's really and the that's most important what, reward. And then when you take that and magnify that. That's right. And well, say so. to people in the city, we have all these people who serve for gratis on city commissions and boards trying yeah, to help. And they're all thankless jobs. Yeah. yeah, they're all trying to, well, but the thank you has to be from yourself. It's internal. And, uh, yeah. Coach Wooden. But it's hard. It's, it, you have to, I guess what I'm saying, you have to have the determination and persistence to know that what you're doing is important for your community and the loud voices are the, are the ones you're going to hear the most. You sort of have to know that you're going to go sure. in. Not a lot of people are giving you a pat on the back. Yeah. You know that you're going to come in and hear the loud, angry people who don't like the thing that's happening. Yeah. Right? You don't get the, hey, you did yeah. such a fabulous yeah. job at this meeting. Thanks. Well, you know, uh, one of my disciples, I guess you'd say, um, Coach John Wooden at UCLA, uh, said that you could never have a good day in life unless you've done something for someone else who will never be able to repay you. You did it because it was selfless. And it wasn't about money. It wasn't about anything else. It was about improving your life by improving someone else's life. Sure. If you take that to our city, it's all about taking life on this block and making it better for everybody. And then the next block and the next block. And yeah, that takes a lot of talking to each other. You can't be angry when you're trying to help somebody who needs it. You have to find a way to work with your neighbors because they're, you have a common cause. It's not about arguing with each other. It's about joining together to help right. someone else's life. We need to do more of that in the city. We do. So why don't we bring this back to um, camps, right? The idea that 
people. YMCA camp, the Boy Scout camp. The, the Y, yeah, I want to talk different about. Different kind of camp. Boys and Girls Club. Um, and no, I, how do we start? And we're talking about listening, right? We're talking about active listening. We're talking about um, how to begin to change the conversation into one where we are actively listening and one where we are not yelling at each other because that doesn't get anything done. But how do we stop name calling? How do we stop the stuff that we learned in preschool that we're not supposed to do that seems to just be rampant in every level of politics? We all learn these lessons in preschool. What do we need to do to have conversations better at the, at the council level? Well, I think I've, I've sort of answered that by being willing to talk to each other, be willing to not attack first, but to listen first. And, and I think, look, there are always going to be different views of issues. I think you find the ones that, on the council, that are common ground. The other issues, you try and understand the other side, and you try and figure out a way to bridge those gaps whenever possible. Um, and I think bridging gaps, that's a good way to, to discuss it, uh, not to prejudge people. I walked in today, and immediately what I do? Prejudged you, didn't I? Right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so... You're friends with X, 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 Y, Z. And I was, I was jabbing you, yeah. you know? But look it, uh, but I did it with a smile on my face. The, yeah. the, the but isn't that interesting? But, but that's interesting. It's an interesting point. Based on if you associate with somebody, you can be put into a camp. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that, isn't that entire premise asinine? Well, it, it is. Look at it. Uh, we'll take me, right? I was part of the SMART group yeah. and wrote articles for seven years. So someone told me during the campaign a year ago, you're against all development. You want the city to stay in stasis. You want us to be frozen, right, in a little glass bubble. And that's not true at all. Not it's also true. impossible. Yeah, well, because right? the city <laughs> is the same as you, a yeah. living, breathing organism. And it's connected to a bigger entity called Los Angeles. Changes, yeah. changes normal. Change can be good if it's in proportion. So do you think people yeah. disagree? Because I've now, I, on all sides, I've, most people, this is another thing that people would agree on, right? If that was at the top of the you know, agenda, like change, everyone agrees that change is normal. We have to accept some degree of change. And uh, you said something right then. Yeah. Some degree. So that's the question. To what is, extent? Is, yes. Is the degree huge? Is it small? How do you find a way to parse that terminology right. and find a way to work together for what different people's perceptions of the common good in the city are? Right. As but the course. narratives that get told are different than what we just stated, right? Absolutely. The narratives are like person XYZ hates development. Right or person X Y Z doesn't want you know it's it, it, it's you, very binary. And if that, you if you hate all development, yeah, I presume you're living on the street, like our our poor homeless humans. Right, because you would hate this apartment. You absolutely hate your fireplace. You hate everything. Right. Sure. And, and so you can't. Everyone at some point through history. Right, the Indians who built teepees in the Midwest, or huts somewhere else, or the the colonists who built their first log cabins. Daniel Boone, developer. Everyone's a developer, right? Uh, theoretically, what you have to look at is the degree and how does it fit in to a broader picture within your city. Sure. And that is the discussion. And, and that's where we cannot afford absolutes because there's always changes normal. The, I saw a picture this morning. Santa Monica Conservancy posted a picture on Twitter and Facebook. It's a lovely picture. But later, when you go to Twitter or Facebook, take a look at it. It's Vaughn's Market, which was Vaughn's either number two or three in their chain. Yep. 
on Euclid and Wilshire, same location, Cease Canyon Vons in 1940. And you look at that Vons, now I would say, I would opine that it was a better Vons then. If you look at to Wilshire Boulevard, the entire store is open. You just walk in anywhere and there's the produce and there's everything. Mm -hmm. And it feels so open and welcoming and so wonderful. On the back of us. No, right? on, the, on Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah, is, is, isn't the entryway? Well, but it was the front the back? on Wilshire. Oh, okay. They turned their back. Um, when I was young, it was probably a second incarnation of Vaughn's. Yeah. Right, but there were still windows along Wilshire. You could enter on Wilshire or through the back, and Cease Candy was there the whole time I was growing up, too. Mm -hmm. And you looked at it, and it was still this wonderful store, right? And then they built the new Vons. And the new Vons turned its back completely on Wilshire, right? There were no windows by the street on Wilshire. There's only those high windows, and you only can enter from the parking lot. Well, they decided that automobile traffic was the way, I would disagree because there were so many people in such really a dense apartment-centric neighborhood that they shouldn't have turned their back. Obviously, they do good business, and they've been there since before 1940. But look at that picture, because you look at that picture and go, all the changes, they didn't really improve the store. You know, the store yeah, looked a little bit like... Uh, here, I, I would characterize the store as you went to the original... Have you been to the original Farmer's Market? Or, or Grand Central Market? Uh, which one is the original? Grand Central one? Market. Have you been to Grand Central? In, in New York? No. Down, downtown LA. Uh, I am not Oh, yes, I think so. Okay. I, so, guess, I, don't, I guess I didn't know it was the original. All right, well, so if yeah. you go there, right, as you walk in, mm -hmm. there's, the, there's the Carnitas this guy here, there's the egg slut person here, mm -hmm. there's all the... And you just walk right in. There's not doors to walk in, it's just open. Mm -hmm. That Vons felt like that, looked yeah, like that. That's a good open experience. And, and, and that's something that I think people crave. This morning, I was at the grand opening of a butcher shop on Montana Avenue. Well, as I walked up there to help cut the ribbon and stand there and do my first ribbon cutting as a city council person, um, what was interesting to me is thinking back thinking back that there was a, a market on 10th in California, a market on 12th in Arizona. There were butcher shops in Santa Monica when I was growing up, and there were little neighborhood markets all over the city. That, that was, you went to, uh, up to your neighbor corner for the, what we call the corner store, but they were all over Santa Monica. I'm not sure that it's better just having three or four big grocery stores. It was a lot nicer. And, and people grew up in New York, right? Go to their local bodegas, they go to their local butcher shops. This reminded me this morning of what used to be in Santa Monica. There used to be, I think, four supermarkets on Montana Avenue alone. And they were all individually owned markets. Mm -hmm. Well, now a butcher shop opened there. I think that's wonderful. And, and for me, especially, because my yeah, grandfather... Just, it's, it's brand new. Yeah my, yeah, my grandfather is a former butcher yeah. who worked at the corner of 3rd and Wilshire because what you know as Barnes & Noble started off originally in the 1940s as Ralph's Supermarket. And my grandfather was a fishmonger there. Wow. So there you go. You don't hear about fishmongers too often these days. No, but that's... That's good. So uh, <laughs> Bristol Farms, the guys who work in yeah, the yeah. fish market part would be a, yeah. a fishmonger. Go ahead. Right. Um, and I took you off subject again. See, I did that very cleverly. <laughs> was that the purpose? Well, uh, well, this is all good background. Um, my, you know... I. I want to st I want to start to understand and because we are getting to the the meat and there's a I suppose this can this and, and that can, goes this with can the butcher fractal, shop it's which oh with the butcher the meat with the, the butcher meat, shop. yeah yeah so all right so let me frame it this way what va what values do we need to embrace and I want to start I want to talk about the solution at um, either at a council meeting or when we're working with people. Who are expressing their opinions, right? There's 
in, in whatever forum or whatever way that they're either emailing you or they're, um, or they're coming up to the council meetings and having their two minutes. What, what you're talking about are, is a set of values, right? Where we need to listen to each other. We need to be able to hear what they're saying, whether or not we agree, and give them the opportunity to change your mind, mm -hmm. right? Because that's really what you're doing. Absolutely. I would hope, right? You're not just saying, sure, I'll listen to whatever you think. I don't really no. care. I would imagine, um, or maybe you are, I don't know. But I would imagine that that's part of what you do. Well, you, um, I, you, you I, I think one of the things that's really important, which we didn't see in the last president, for instance, we didn't see a willingness to have an open mind and listen to new research, listen to new data, listen to new ways of thinking and saying, oh, maybe I can do that. Instead, it was, I form my opinion, yeah. and I will never adjust or change my opinion. I don't, I don't think you can govern that way. You can't govern that way. And, and uh, you know, you sort of characterize city councils, what do we do to, to um, find a way to work together more? You're a team, I'm, right? But Essentially. I'm gonna, but I'm going <laughs> to give you. I'm going to give you a little different opinion. Well, we're the board of directors You're, for the city, right? And I would say that, as much as maybe it doesn't feel, uh, it feels cluttered, and maybe it feels like we're not all rowing in the same direction all the time. That's actually okay, and and the reason for that is that means there is an exchange of ideas. And for a long time on the city council, six or seven council people all rode in the same direction, but residents didn't feel they were heard. I right. mentioned this earlier. Now residents feel heard, and yeah, it's messy. Democracy's messy. But I think we're getting better decisions for residents because we're asking questions of staff. We're not blindly accepting. Uh, you know, what our city staff are giving us. We're still asking questions. We're trying to make sure we get better product. And, and I would think that if you were at Apple in the early days, they would have had fierce arguments. Yeah. And, and that's why you got better, hopefully, better yeah. iMacs and better phones and everything else because they, while they were being creative, they also weren't passive. So... I would say that our city council right now is not passive by any means, that people have strong opinions, and that um, they're willing to question more than we have in the last decade or so. And I'm, I'm actually really proud of that. I'm really proud that we don't come into meetings with uh, everything already decided, because it used to feel, when I would watch council meetings, that everything was decided in a back room in advance. Now, legally, we know that's not what happens, but you had people on the council with the same ideo ideological feel. Yeah, which doesn't help for diversity of thought. And, and now, of course, we're getting yeah. much more diversity of thought. Yeah. So it may seem that, my God, why isn't everything a seven nothing vote? Yeah. I'm the happy. Well, a lot of things are seven. Not, it's, it's, well, it's, but boilerplate Aren't most stuff. of them seven nothing votes? Some are, but we're asking questions now. There are consent items. Yeah. Consent item calendar is where the staff are giving you items just to sure. vote on and sure. approve. And now we're looking and saying, why is that contract so long? Yeah. Why uh, didn't we get more competitive bids? Do we have to do things the same way that we've done them for the last 20 or 30 years? It, are there new, better ways? Yeah. I think that's positive. And um, for the record, yeah. I'm not getting any emails that uh, use bad language or uh, call me the task unduly. And, and I try and answer you know, those emails. Are some of your colleagues? I don't know. That would be a good question to ask. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Because um, you would hope you would hope that your cop because the goal is not to get to a seven zero vote. If you have a four three, that's fine. You're, that 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 means that there's real reasons that people yeah. are thinking are important here. The 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 issue is is not in the trying to get unanimous votes. It's in how things are communicated and the way that we don't have to have a polarized space 
and that people can feel that all sides are, are, are being considered and maybe you don't always get what you want every time, right? Sometimes well, you, well, you're not supposed to get what you want every time. And, you know, the, the art of, of right of business. Everyone, and, and everyone's a little... I'm happy. Everyone's right a little bit end. disappointed. And but that's not the way... But that, that's true. So, so if everyone knew that, and you'd say, okay, well, you know, this one, we have a few, uh, or I won this one, you know, this went my way in the way that I think is important. And, you know, in a different vote, it's going to go a different way. But the, importance, the important thing is that people aren't writing. If you're not getting any hateful emails, that's great. I'm, um, I, I guess if it was me, I'd say, well, I, wonder, I don't want any of my team members, uh, anyone else on my board of directors, getting hateful emails. Because that means that what's best for the community is not being thought of, right? There's still people that are unhappy and they should understand the way that a democracy should work. Right. The, the email that we get, and probably all of us get every day, is very concerned about life on our streets, um, concerned about our unhoused humans on our streets, the over a thousand here every day. They're concerned about random assaults. They're concerned about the basic stuff of can our police force do more? Is our city attorney doing enough? Um, why aren't we doing enough? Why haven't we magically solved those issues? Yeah. Um, and, and they're all very complex. And we're doing more now than was being done a year ago. Um, we're making progress. But the problem some days look intractable. I, I, there are nights when I get an email at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, as I'm going to bed finally, and, and someone's been assaulted, someone's been hurt, something's been stolen. For me, all those things weigh very heavily on me. Um, maybe they shouldn't, but they do. And those are the things that we get mail on. It's not, uh, you get mail on this morning, I think it was graffiti. There's a, there's a graffiti artist who, not an artist, sorry. A I don't, I don't a, want to insult vandal? you. I don't want to insult you. No, is it, vandal, it's art or vandalism? Vandal. Okay. And he's doing the Cloverfield Park bathrooms daily. Yeah. Our, our people scrub them down, right? Get back. rid of it. Yeah. Next day he's back. Yeah. And this is continuous. Are there art on those walls? No. If there was art, you'd be less likely to do it. This is just saying. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, you have arsonists running around our city right now. Yeah. We have various fires springing up all over. And it's just homeless people acting out, homeless people, you know, uh, not being engaged enough sure. by or good activity. Hurt. Yeah. Uh, it's a way, yeah, it's a way to be heard sometimes. It's their way of being heard. And yeah. So we need to do more. I, I think right now in our city, in downtown, on Main Street, all over the city, we need to find ways to be more effective um, in the city at, at, at reducing that level of anger, reducing the dependence on fentanyl and meth, reducing those things. Because that's actually the anger that I get from residents in letters is why can't you solve this? Why can't you do more? And I'm saying the same thing. If you watched a council meeting a couple of weeks ago, I'm asking where are our homeless services? What are we doing? What is the effectiveness? Why can't we do more? We must do more. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I've characterized, maybe wrongly, but I've characterized our services somewhat as benign neglect. You know, we have homeless services on the street, 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, some Monday through Thursday. There's nobody on the streets after 4 p.m. to help. And Saturday and Sundays, you notice I didn't mention those because we have no homeless services working. But the problem is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and I don't know about you, because you have this great idyllic life, 
but but I but I I uh, you know I think when we you know the old characterization is when we all go to sleep. Yeah. That's when our demons surface, right? Yeah. I can't get to sleep because oh my god, I got to do this tomorrow. I got to be up at this time. There, right? I didn't get this done. There's the worries. Yeah. And now you have a child, you got more worries. Yeah. Joy too, and elation, yeah. but worries. Um, I think those people on our streets suffer from benign neglect in our city at night and weekends. And the fact that we have no homeless services every morning east of Lincoln Boulevard in our city, yet we have people who are unhoused who aren't being talked to every morning and said, how do we, how do we get you off the streets? How do we get you into services? How do we get you that new ID card, that new driver's license? How do we find a way to go get you into rehab? If your if your family in Indiana would accept you back and try and give you love and get you cleaned up, would you go? If you'll go, we'll pay for you to go. What is it that we can do as a city, as a people in the city? to be more compassionate, but also make sure that everyone in the city, whether you're housed or unhoused, is also accountable for their actions. Sure. So how do we... Those well, this is good common ground, by the way. This is, this is the kind of common ground that we're talking about where we're not... I can't imagine too many people would disagree that we need to be more responsible in how we handle the situation with homelessness. I think there are... I, well, I've run into opposition with people who have said, it's it's okay. We're doing as much as we can do. We're spending, as we found out two weeks ago, we're spending five million a year without police or fire, without right. those costs. And so my question is, is it effective? Sure. And and even if it's somewhat effective, what can we do better? Are there better methods? Is there something we can do? To we're not talking about the cause. We're talking about the approach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So we're we're saying at a cause we, we, level, we, everyone we, would everyone would. The only way you can help the cause is I, I'd go back to my nonprofits and schools, and I'd say when kids are small, mm -hmm. you give them after school facilities. You give them help. Yeah. You don't neglect a child. You don't expect them to have the money to go to private schools or sure. private camps. You help everyone equally at the start. And, and as a country, this is not local, this yeah. is as a country, we don't invest in the next generations. And, and you see so many people have dropped out and become addicted because they felt left out. You have veterans who come back from overseas and those veterans are, are left with PTSD. Back when I was a little kid, they used to call it shell shock. But they're, they're suffering. They've lost limbs. They've seen their brothers in, in arms die. Yeah. In, in wars, you and I would probably question. And yet when they come back, they're thrown out on the streets, maybe with a drug habit because of their injuries, and left to rot. We have, as a country, we have to change that. And no, I don't think anyone, most people would not disagree with that either. But right? we, we have to find ways yeah. to solve that. We have to find ways to do what we can in the city. And at the same time, we can't accept the issues we see here daily. When my mother's neighbor got pushed to the ground on 20th in Arizona last Friday, um, Car stopped, luckily, two inches before her head. Mm -hmm. She would have been... Oh, I saw about this. Is, yeah. And, and she's 83. She was waiting for her daughter to pick her up mm -hmm. um, at 20th in Arizona. And that's a noon. We can't afford that kind of behavior on our streets. So we've got to, I believe, uh, homeless street services, people concerned, West Coast Care, Salvation Army... St. Joseph's Center, whoever it is, my ideal, mm -hmm. my goal is that every homeless person in the city has a visit every morning from good people trying to 
get them off the streets, not accepting their conditions. Now, part of this is, yes, work with the state, work with everyone else. Someone to visit the, is about, I don't know what the count, they didn't do the count this year, right? Not yet. So it was, Another but, but it's something in the thousand range, right? Uh, about a thousand? Yeah. A thousand Cons people. Conservatively. Conservatively. Yeah. So someone would go around and talk to a thousand people, ultimately you'd have well, or, you, or a handful of a team. You have teams. So right now you have teams from the people concerned that go out on the streets. Mm -hmm. West Coast Care covers the 3.2 miles of beachfront every morning. And yeah, they're supposed to stop and talk to people. And whether it's offering them water and then saying, how about services? How do we... How do we move you off the street? How do we get you somewhere? Mm -hmm. Is it time to get off drugs? Is it time to? Yeah. And, and keep going. You're not going to get someone off the streets unless you talk to them 20 or 30 times. So that, to me, can't be daunting. We have to do it. Sure. And, and we have to make sure that if you're homeless at Clover Park, there's a gentleman who's on Ocean Park. At, at Boulevard at Clover Park has been there over a year. Over a year. There was a guy at Reed Park who had been there almost four years. We can't give up on those people and we can't leave them on the streets. We have to find ways to help them, entice them, do what we can to get them off the streets. Sure. So what's the next sort of... So I, And I know I took you in a completely different direction, but, <laughs> but you're, you sort of <laughs> asked what kind of mail do I get? Yeah. That's the mail I get. Those are the issues that, to me, are paramount. It's not whether someone builds another six-story apartment house, but that has to be um, in an area where it's acceptable, where it's not going to negatively impact the neighborhood. Not everything's going to stay one story, but we also have to make sure that we make this still a comfortable place to live and a comfortable place to park your car right. outside a comfortable place to feel that you can take your child down to the beach in the morning or your wife can take a walk. Yeah, and I, I, this is another one of those things where I have to imagine people at, 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 at the fundamental level completely agree with you and the approach, how, what approach you take to do that and how much money it costs and who's impacted by those decisions. If there's people are moved from, you know, displaced and you put almost people in front of someone's front yard that previously didn't have them, right? Then people whose neighborhood that is get upset that why is there almost people in front of my front yard now? I just, you know, they, then they, they worry about their real estate prices. Well, um, and they worry like, about safety. And, and look, at there's that perception. It's not always reality. Not every homeless person is dangerous. But people are worried about the overall effect, I don't, I, I, so for me, actually, I never would think about real estate value. What I would think about is that poor soul in the street. Yeah. How do, how do we get them help? How do we get them off the street? And why isn't the state government doing more? Sure. The state government just said, we have $39 billion of extra money. And I'm saying, hey, we could use right. some of that. I want my state senator and my state assemblyman and the governor. Sure to not only preach that, look, at we have this great surplus. Right. I want them to put it in action, Sure. helping us. I want those services. I want more mental health uh, psychiatrists on our streets. I'm happy we got one coming. But the real estate, so this is a good example. So the real estate values are a good example. of Most people probably wouldn't want to come out and say that publicly. Like, I can't believe this is happening and my real estate values are going to get affected. But that happens with tons of things. It happens with the airport, yeah. right? There's all sorts of stuff. That like, that can happen. That can affect your real estate value. And perhaps as a council, a councilman, you are not going to use that as valid input. Real estate values is not part of the input for you, right? Well, and in Santa Monica, real estate values are beyond belief. Sure, as it is because we're a beach community. There's always going to be that need to come here. Yeah. The question for me, if you want to get into business, the question for me is different. Is if you are a tourist and you're at Shutters and you walk out of Shutters and there are five homeless people on the sidewalk going up and someone rang and raving and you suddenly are afraid to walk down the boardwalk in the city and you thought you were coming to this wonderful beach of LA that was going to be clean and neat and safe and now you walk down the promenade at night and you're scared rightly or wrongly yeah 
that's where you that we're gonna we see the decline there because the hotels tell me right that they have significant issues with people checking out early right so you came here to stay for a week and after two days you're like I should have stayed in Beverly Hills sure I should have stayed somewhere else that's an issue this is it so these are and the reason I'm I'm, I'm harping on the real estate folks is because it's just a cohort it could be anything but this is a, a group of people who feel a certain way about why something happened and they're going to be angry about it now the transparency of the information that goes to them that makes them not angry about it so that they don't take up your time at meetings of things that you probably could have maybe in some way said hey look this is why this is we understand where you're coming from, but this is why we're voting on this situation so that they understand. It's not about them being right or wrong. It's about, I think, and this would help uh, quell a lot of the, uh, the, the anger and vitriol that people have, is, is they, they feel unheard, where they feel like they, they haven't been heard in a long time, and it's our time. But that, and that's, and rightfully so, in a lot of cases. But for, these, for some of these cohorts, is there an opportunity to let them know that like, here's why we did a thing and we're speaking to you directly now to this cohort of people who may be upset about this, but the decision we had to make here was for the following reasons. And that's laid out beautifully so that, and again, I'm just exploring what the possibility well, is. Look, I, I, you're taking it at a different level, but I, I'm going back to what I said a while ago in this interview. Do town halls, communicate with the residents directly. Yeah give them a chance to feel heard yeah and give them the chance to understand we didn't have more money but the minute we have more money we're going to add to our efforts and sure. in the meantime we're going to look at more innovative ways to solve these issues we're going to look at ways to make sure that not only are you heard but that we react positively to, to what your concerns are and those are things yeah. that we're supposed to do all the time that that residents didn't always feel were being done. We have a new administration. Yeah. How is the town hall circuit right now? Just well, it's, not, it's not a circuit for me. Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, we have a new city manager. We have a new police yeah. chief. We'll have a new city attorney on deck within 60 days. Um, we are revamping city leadership. We're making sure that the leadership of the city will also be very responsive yeah. To all residents, whether they have money or not, whether a developer or in a rent control department somewhere, whether they're 30 years old or 85 years old, I want them heard. And, and that to me is significantly important. Great. Well, I think there's, you know, I, I, I see where you're coming from and I think it's, Totally valid. I think uh, hopefully we can, and I guess around, you know, what I believe is when communication is better, many problems get resolved. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I'm seeing is there's a communication issue at all levels. Not as, uh, we're you know, getting better. The city, getting, is, the city is improving. I, I can tell you that our new city manager is responding to residents' concerns daily. Yeah. And, and really making that effort. He is going to change the vibe, the atmosphere in City Hall to where all staff members in our city feel that it is their most important duty is to make sure that they hear residents. Great. And, and, and uh, for the last few years, uh, staff morale was down. Um, they didn't feel appreciated, but they also didn't feel heard. What team and, is and doing that at the city? What, what, uh, what's coming what from department? the city manager? And the, that should be all departments. And, and that means, oh, it's not, know, sorry, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a specific department. No, it, it should be all departments from your plumbers to your electricians to the water department people to uh, department heads in city hall. Yeah. They have to remember. Customer service. There was a. Uh, I love that. A, by the way, a former, it's a great way of thinking about it. There was a former city manager. Yeah. Uh, back in 2005 to 2010, and Lamont uh, had all the staff used to wear a button. I think it said, "We do the right things right." And when I've talked to staff, they believe that they believe that they were supposed to find ways to do the right things right for every resident, and they worked 
above their pay grades many times to try and solve those problems. Yeah. Well, that's what I want. And look, at the, and that comes from the board of directors, the city council, to your CEO, the city manager, right? All the way down the flow charts, everyone in the city has to, everyone who works for the city has to feel that they are empowered to solve our customer problems and our customers, yeah. and, and not only hear them, it, it, one of- uh, It's nice to hear you say that, I, I, that, that, to look at it from a customer service perspective, because it's exactly what it is, right? Yeah, and someone, uh, one of the candidates for city manager a few months ago, Yeah, a couple of my city council people got sort of upset at, at that terminology, but he said, I want my city to have Nordstrom level service. And I'm not sure if Nordstrom is no longer is, is the standard bearer, but you always hear these wonderful stories, you know, about their service and about how they go a step beyond to take care of customers. Yeah. Well, that's what your city government should do. Yeah. There's I, a prime minister, Edi yeah. Rama uh, of Albania. Okay. This is a really interesting story. He was also known for some kind of uh, restoring a lot of stuff with beautiful art, but he, uh, he thought of, he started thinking about, he had like a kiosk in the middle, like a customer service booth. Uh, it was, I, if I recall correctly, something like that, where he really thought of it in that way. And it was a good case study. Uh, and it always, it always reminded me that when people are paying, your, your residents are uh, in large part paying your salaries. Not large part, <laughs> large. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. So the, when you look at it from that perspective, you say, wow, these are the people I need to serve. And again, the purpose, I guess the real purpose in my comfort or what I'm trying to solve is how do we do this kindly? Because if we can be kinder, um, we can hear each other better. We give the space to breathe and listen. There's more of that. And perhaps we can empathize and understand where people are coming from so that even when something doesn't go our way, there's an opportunity right. to, to, to say, you know what? I get why it didn't go my way. Maybe the next one will go in the way that I think, but it's a balance of that kind of thinking and behavior, I think. And I guess that's the purpose of why, uh, of a lot of why I'm, I'm here in the first place is to have these conversations, right. to be with you here, and, and to just to start thinking about that um, as part of the day-to-day -day of what we need to do to, so that the board of directors has easier times, right. uh, perhaps not staying up till, you know, the wee hours yeah. too often. 3 a.m. meetings. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, well, we can solve that in other ways. The city council needs, we, as a city, we need to work on the, on the city council meeting more often about the city council getting more tools to prepare. Uh, the city council having those, the tools they need, the means that they need to make sure they're making great decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that, that will take some time. Sure. We'll get there as well. Team building exercises. There you go. Well, we're going to have a retreat sometime at the end of March. The retreat, where we yeah. We spend a whole day just talking. Trust falls. Hopefully talking to each other. So <laughs> you all have to do trust falls. There you go. That's the that'll build the trust. There you go. Um, but uh, well, thank you for being here with me today. No problem. And spending the time, uh, I enjoyed this, and and hopefully together we can all come together, get rid of the camps, understand where people are coming from. And there needs to be one camp in Santa Monica. Santa Monica. That's the camp. Good to see camp you. Camp Santa Monica. Talk to you later.